will, turn in your Bibles to the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel as we continue our study through the Word. So as we start the second half of Daniel, Daniel's 12 chapters long, there's six chapters that we have covered already, and, and those really kind of follow the, the chronological order of Daniel's life, kind of telling us the story of Daniel's uh, life. But when we get to the final six chapters, we are going to see that these are now going to be uh, revelations, dreams, prophetic visions that God gave to Daniel. Now, in the first six chapters, we saw prophetic revelation and, and we saw it interpreted, but I want you to notice that it wasn't given to Daniel. Daniel was always the one that was revealing something that was given to somebody else, and then Daniel would come in and be able to interpret that. Here in the second half, we are going to see that these are the revelations now that God gave to Daniel himself, and then also the understanding that we will look at of those revelations. And, and so we are going to see here that you know, that Daniel, now, he lived during the times of the Gentiles. We see that the times of the Gentiles, it, it began when the Babylonians destroyed now the, the Jerusalem. And, and we see that no longer is the nation of Israel, a sovereign nation. They are now a, a conquered nation by a, a world uh, empire. A and so he is taken into captivity, uh, into Babylon during that period of time. And, and that's the beginning of the time of the Gentiles. These world empires are going to uh, rise and they are going to conquer uh, one another. And the nation of Israel is going to be underneath these different empires that are going to rise up again. And we see that the, the time of the Gentiles, now the nation of Israel is not going to have its sovereignty back until the end of the times of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles will end at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so you have the period from Daniel's life, and he lived in, you know, 2,500 years ago until the return of Jesus Christ, the second coming, and the world empires, the events that are going to take place in the world that are told to Daniel and the revelation of these events that are going to take place. So the history of the world, of the world that, uh, that you and I, we look back on, but Daniel was in the first wave. He was the first one. So he and his captives were taken captive into Babylon, and that began what is known as the time of the Gentiles. Now, as we come to this seventh chapter, it is going to be a vision that the Lord gives to us. But chronologically, it is out of order. You'll remember that chapter six ended with Daniel in the lion's den, and, and that happened when he is very old. But we see that these events are going to take place in the first year that Belshazzar comes to power. Now, you'll remember that Nebuchadnezzar, we saw that at the end of chapter 3 where he gives glory to God and we see that you know he had his sanity taken from him and then restored back to him. And, and so all of those events took place back in chapter 3. But we see then chapter 4 is where Belshazzar has his feast, and we see that that is when then Belshazzar falls. But this prophecy that we are going to see here in this seventh chapter, it happens in the first year that Belshazzar comes to power. And so Belshazzar becomes a co-regent. His first year is when he becomes co-regent. His dad, Nebulus, he was the king at the time, but he was outside of the city of Babylon. He had his army outside, and so he was fighting outside. And we see that Belshazzar then became the co-regent. He was named co-regent king inside of Babylon, inside of the city walls uh, itself. And so uh, we see here that this is the beginning now uh, of these prophecies. And so uh, we will look at those time frames. Uh, but uh, we are going to, uh, to see the incredible, 
incredible description of these world empires that are going to come about. Daniel was looking at them prophetically ahead of time. The Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the, the Medo-Persian Empire, all of those hadn't even been heard of or thought of. Babylon is still the, uh, the world power when Daniel here is writing this seventh chapter that we are going to uh, look at. But we are going to see the, the minutest details and the descriptions of these world powers. And we see that there is only four world powers that have ever dominated the face of the, the, the land. We have the Babylonians, and then from the time of the captivity. Now, we had the Assyrians, and we would consider possibly them as a, uh, as a world power at that time, but they never captured Jerusalem. The temple in Jerusalem never came underneath the authority of the Assyrians. And so from Daniel's captivity by the Babylonians forwards, these are the world empires that have dominated on the face of the globe. We see that there was a fifth world empire. You had the Babylonians, and then they were replaced by the Medo-Persians, and then the Medo-Persians were replaced by the Greeks, and then the Greeks by the Romans. And then you will remember in that statue where the Roman Empire now kind of crumbled uh, from within, and there's never been another world empire. It says that the feet, though, are ten toes made up of iron and also of clay, that there is going to be one last world empire that is going to come underneath the domination of the Antichrist. But that has not risen up yet. We're going to see a lot more details about this last uh, empire. There was another world empire that, that, that was sought after, and, uh, and it was called World War II. It was Adolf Hitler that tried to take over the entire world and to dominate the entire world, but that bid was unsuccessful, and, and never did the Nazis into Germany ever completely become a, a world empire, but it took a world war to prevent that from taking place. And so not Germany isn't listed here, and Hitler isn't listed here because they never ended up becoming a world empire. The accuracy of these things, the, the, the empires that were built and, and the characteristics, the descriptions of those world empires written ahead of time describing what would be the hallmark features of them, what would be the descriptions of them so that you would be able to go and identify these not only in perfect sequence but also in the description of them is absolutely stunning. God is the one that says that I stand outside of time. I will tell you the end uh, from the beginning that you may know that, that I am the true and the living God. Jesus said, I tell you these things in advance that when they come to pass that you may believe. Uh, that you may believe. That your faith will absolutely increase. That you will trust with all of your heart in the true and the living God that has revealed himself in a way that, uh, that nobody else could, nobody else uh, ever will. He is the one true living God that you can trust with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen? Amen. Chapter 7, book of Daniel, verse 1. Let's go. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. And then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. And so here we see that uh, that now, uh, you know, Daniel is in the first year of Belshazzar. So this is 14 years uh, earlier than his experience in the lion's den that we saw back in, in chapter 6. And, uh, and so he is so disturbed uh, by it. Daniel is about 68 years old when, uh, when he's in the lion's den. Uh, and so if you go back 14 years, he's uh, uh, about 54 years old or so. Uh, he was taken captive at the age of 16 as a teenager and then spent his life there in Babylon. So he's about a 50-year-old, young 50-year-old, when he has this dream and it wakes him up and it disturbs him and he writes 
the, the dream down. Have you ever had a dream? Hey, you wake up the next morning. I mean, it is vivid. It is real. You know, sometimes you even think you're still in the dream, but then you don't write it down. And you go and try and tell somebody a while later. And it's like, I can't remember that dream, you know, that I had this morning. Belshazzar wakes up and immediately he knows this was an important dream. And he, immediately he takes pen to paper and he records uh, now uh, for us the dream that, uh, that God had shown him. Verse 2, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now, uh, the the sea is oftentimes a a representation in the scriptures of the multitude of the people uh, here upon the earth. And and so we've got the the four winds that now are blowing, and it says it's stirring up the people, the population, the the earth is all stirred up uh, here. Now, the great sea in the scriptures we see refers to the Mediterranean, uh, and so this is the, the great sea in uh, Europe that is surrounded by the, uh, the, the Mediterranean and through Israel and down to Egypt. So the, the known world here, the Mediterranean Sea, is the, is the great sea. And so it says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different uh, from the other. And so from the sea, the multitudes from the Gentile nations emerge in succession four fearsome beasts, and, and they go on to the, uh, the shore. And, and we see here that chapter 7 is going to parallel in chapter 2, and uh, chapter 2 is the statue of uh, of. of gold with the head of gold and the chest of silver and the belly of bronze and the legs of iron and the feet with the toes and and all and so we see that that this is a parallel to the interpretation of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had Nebuchadnezzar had it as a statue with the four different pieces that and parts of the statue here we see that Daniel sees these these beasts that are coming out uh, of the sea, and there's four of them, and they come in in succession. And and so, as you look back to chapter 2 and refresh yourself with that, this chapter is going to amplify the revelation of the Gentile powers that are going to dominate the earth. And and so we are going to see that, uh, that these four beasts that he's going to describe are uh, a, a winged lion and a ravenous bear and a swift leopard. And then there's a, a fearsome ten-horned beast. And, uh, and so also you will remember that at the end of, uh, of that statue that there was a stone that wasn't cut by human hands that rose up and then it demolished and destroyed uh, all of the, uh, of the other parts parts of that statue. And, and so we see that that ultimately now is the son of man and he is installed as Lord over all the earth. So here he sees these four fearsome beasts and, and it says, and the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So here we see that this refers to the Babylonian Empire. Now, archaeologists uh, have revealed that the national emblem of Babylon was a lion with wings. That was their national emblem. And so here he sees this lion with wings that comes uh, out. It says, in, and this winged lion now, it says that its wings were plucked off so that instead of flying, it now stands on the ground. And so a human heart is given to it. So these are the highlights of Nebuchadnezzar's career. We see that, you know, he was the lion with the, with the eagle's wings, but then those eagle's wings are, are afterwards pulled out, and, and he was made to stand just like a man. He had been exalted by the wings when puffed up with pride, and then what happened? He was laid low. Those wings were torn off of him, and he was dropped onto his face like a man, and we see that his insanity was taken away from him, and then at the end, what happened is 
God gave him a new heart, restored his insanity to him. And so this is a, a description of the, of the life and the career now uh, of a Nebuchadnezzar. And suddenly, it says another beast, a second, like a bear. And it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise and devour much in flesh. So we see that this, this second beast is, uh, is now representative of the Medo-Persian empire. Now, we see that, that the, it is typified here as a, uh, as a bear, an animal of, of tremendous strength. And we see that the Medo-Persian Empire, it was noted, and what made it so strong was the size of its army. It had over two and a half million men in their army. And so, like a bear, they just came in with just sheer numbers, with just sheer force, with just sheer power. And this is the way the, uh, the Medo-Persians came in and uh, attacked. And so, uh, it says that, that the bear was tilted up on one side. And so, one side was higher than the other. And so, the higher side, this is representative of Persia. Uh, because Persia ended up... Uh, uh, overcoming, overshadowing the Medes in their united kingdom. And, and this bear had three ribs in its mouth. And so the, the picture of this bear with these three ribs, and those three ribs are the nations that it had devoured, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire uh, devoured the, the Babylonians, uh, the nation of Lydia, and also Egypt. And so these are the, the three ribs that are in its mouth. And in verse 6, And after this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings, uh, of a bird. And this beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. So this third beast now is a leopard. Leopards are known for their incredible speed. That's what a leopard's profound strength is, is, is their speed. And of course, this is representative of the Grecian Empire of the Greeks. It refers to Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, the way that he conquered was with speed. He only had a, a, an army of 35,000 men. Compare that to two and a half million. But the way that Alexander the Great moved is he moved so fast that he struck cities before they were even ready for him. The, the soldiers would run from one city to the next. The messengers would barely get there, letting them know that an army was coming. And Alexander the Great and his troops were already there, were already upon the city. And then you never knew which way he was going to go and the, the speed of his advances. And, and so Alexander the Great, in four years, four years, he conquered the entire world with the swiftness and the speed of his army. It says that he had four wings, and that speaks of, of just an unnatural, supernatural speed. Just two wings is, is the most that you have. Four wings here we see that this now speaks of that incredible speed with which he moved. It had four heads. Notice that it said, and dominion was given to it. Alexander the Great died very young. And when he died, the successor was not strong enough to take over the world empire that he had built. And so it was divided up amongst four of his generals that each now became those four heads and authority, dominion was given to each of those generals. And so an accurate description of Alexander the Great and the Medo-Persian Empire. But then what came next was the Roman Empire. And now, look at the description that Daniel has. All of these things are, are, are way in the future. He, he doesn't even know what he's writing. He's just writing these descriptions of the things that are going to come. And so he's got pen in hand, and, and it says, And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. Dreadful. Terrible. Exceedingly strong. It had iron teeth. And it was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. 
And so this fourth beast, now we see it was dreadful. He describes it. It was terrifying. The other beasts had been likened to an animal. But here, this last beast was so dreadful, it wasn't even likened to any animal. It's just described as, as a beast here. And so and the fourth was the most terrifying and the most powerful, more powerful than the three preceding beasts. And we see that it was ferocious and destructive. This beast had large iron teeth with which it was able to just crush and to devour its prey. And so we see here that, uh, that now uh, this kingdom is representative of the uh, Roman Empire. The Roman Empire and the Roman soldiers. We see that uh, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, were recruited into the army, into the Roman army. You enlisted for 25 years, and then when you retired after that, you were given land and citizenship. And so they built this incredible army. We see here that, uh, that ultimately now, at the end of that, it was, fell apart, it moral decay from within. But we see that there is these ten horns. These ten horns talks about now the, what in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar were the feet. And these are the confederation of these ten kings that are going to rise up together. And so we see that this now is going to be built into a federation that is going to come out of Europe and out of the European nations that were a part of the Roman Empire and and so the, the description here of this fourth beast. And, and Daniel now, as he's looking at this fourth beast, he's interested in these ten horns. He's looking at the ten horns. And the ten horns were representative now of the ten different kings and the, uh, that are going to be assimilated and together. Now, back in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, the feet, the toes were made out of iron and clay. And so in the revived Roman Empire that is going to ultimately be now the, the fifth world power, this is going to be the force that the Antichrist uh, rises up to be the head of. The toes are of metal, but also of clay. And metal and clay don't melt into each other. The metal speaks of some strength, but the clay is brittle and would break apart the, the metal. So it, it's going to have some strength, but it, there's also going to be a fragileness to the nature of this final empire that the Antichrist is going to rise up. So there's going to be a confederation that is there that's got 10 kings or 10 nations that now are going to be a part of this. I was considering the horns and, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. And so here we see that uh, Daniel talks about this, uh, this little horn, and, and its beginning was insignificant. It was insignificant. It was just this little tiny horn. But we notice that this little horn now was noted for its intelligence. It had the eyes of a man, and also for its blasphemous claims. It had a, a mouth that spoke boastfully. It is prideful. And so this little horn here is the Antichrist. He, he is known by many different names and titles, the son of perdition. He is the beast, the Antichrist, the, the man of sin. Uh, and so uh, here we see in, uh, that the description of him, and, uh, and we see that there are going to be these three horns that, uh, that now bow down <laughs> to him. And, uh, and so... Uh, book of Revelation tells us that this Antichrist is going to uh, receive a head wound 
and that he is going to recover from it. And so uh, no doubt there is going to be some type of an assassination attempt uh, on him. People are going to think that, uh, that he is dead. He is going to suffer a great wound. Uh, but he is going to survive uh, that wound. And, and so uh, here we see his introduction in, in the book of in Daniel. In verse 9, we see that uh, the scene shifts and, and it says, And I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated, and his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. And his throne was a fiery flame and its wheels a burning fire. We see that this throne recalls the very same one that Ezekiel describes back in the first chapter where the glory of the Lord is described and, and the throne. And, and so we see that he sits on the throne, it blazes with fire, the wheels on which it rested moved about and were ringed with flame as well, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. And a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him and the court was seated and the books were opened. And so ten thousand times ten thousand is hundreds of millions. Celestial beings now are, are standing here and, and we see that, that this a little horn is going to be brought before the ancient of days. And, and we see that God the judge takes his seat there in this celestial court and the, and the books uh, are uh, opened. And, and so uh, we see here, no doubt, presumably they are containing the, the sins of the little horn and also all who followed after him. And, and so we see here that the stage is set for the great white throne judgment of uh, bringing in now the wicked and the unrepentant to, to stand before the, uh, the ancient of uh, days. And, and so... Revelation chapter 5 talks about the, uh, the coming before. And, and then we also have the book and uh, the scroll. And you'll remember in Revelation where it talks about who is worthy to open the scroll. And, uh, and so here we see the lion of the tribe of Judah. And verse 11, And I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. And I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a, and a time. We see here that Daniel says his attention was uh, on the little horn because it was boasting. And, and we see here that he saw that, uh, that this fourth beast now, uh, it was slain, it was consigned now to judgment and and this slaying of that fourth beast now this event is going to be what terminates now the uh, the time of the gentiles and and so he watched it until the antichrist was slain and and his body is cast into gehenna into the burning flame in revelation chapter 19 verse 20 it says and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, and which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. And these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And so he, he watched until his body was destroyed and, and given now to the burning flames. And, and then it says that these other kingdoms, they had their dominion taken away. Now, what does that mean? It means that here that these kingdoms still exist today. We see that they're not a world power anymore, but those kingdoms still exist. And we see that Babylon today, it exists. It's known as Iraq. Persia still exists today. It is called Iran. Greece still exists. And so these kingdoms still exist, but they don't have any world power any longer. So here we see those kingdoms still in existence. I was watching in the night visions, and behold... 
one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And so now in this third major portion of the vision, the first vision were the terrible beasts. The second part of the vision was now the great white throne and the ancient of days. And now we have the Son of Man. And we see that the Son of Man is, is Jesus Christ. And we see that that Son of Man, this is the prophecy that describes now Jesus Christ. Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. 31 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, it says, And he began to teach that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So we see that Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. And here we see the description of the Son of Man in the book of Daniel. So, Christ uh, uh, now uh, emphasizes his uh, return to earth. We see that he's going to come in, in the clouds. He, he is going to come uh, with great power and glory. And so uh, here in Daniel's vision, we see the Lord and we see him coming with the clouds uh, uh, of heaven. And then he comes to the, uh, the ancient uh, of uh, days. And, uh, and so uh, nothing could be clearer than that Jesus himself regarded Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 uh, as a, a description of himself uh, like a son of man with the clouds of heaven combined then to constitute uh, what is known as a messianic title. In verse 14, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. In his dominion, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And so how awesome uh, is uh, that? We see the uh, Son of Man is brought into the presence of the Ancient uh, of Days and all authority, it says glory uh, and power, uh, have been exercised, that had been exercised by the uh, rulers of the four kingdoms over the, the nations. We see that all of that now is given unto the Lord. And this is also in keeping with the promise of Psalm chapter 2, uh, verses 6 through 9. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion, and I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son, and today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession." And you shall break them with the rod of iron, and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And so we see that, uh, that all of these other kingdoms had an end, but the kingdom of Christ will have no end. We see that his authority uh, now is an everlasting uh, authority. And so and here we see that he is going to be the sovereign power over the earth, uh, over the nations, every language. And Christ is going to be the, uh, the supreme source of authority on earth and his earthly kingdom is established and, and every single race, every single nationality, every ethnic origin, every language is going to bow down and worship and serve him. And that for a thousand years. And so at the end of these other beasts, we see that now the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years. And, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, and when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So at the end of the millennial reign, Jesus surrenders the kingdom to the Father, after which Christ then is appointed as ruler over God's eternal kingdom and that forever. So 
Daniel has this dream, and he, he writes it down. And he says in verse 15, and, and I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. And I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these dreams. And so, like Nebuchadnezzar, you'll remember that he woke up and he had been disturbed uh, by uh, the dream that he had. Well, this parallel dream that Daniel has is disturbing to Daniel as well. And though he had been able to, uh, to interpret the, the, the other dreams on the previous occasions, this one he did not have the interpretation for. So he calls upon one of those standing by. Uh, later on, we're going to find out that this angel that he calls upon ends up being Gabriel. And so Gabriel now interprets the vision for him. He says, those great beasts which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and uh, ever. And so here we see that uh, those uh, four empires, those four kings represent Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greek, uh, and the Greece, and also uh, Rome. And then uh, we see that uh, there is the kingdom of the Lord that is going to be ruled over with the saints, and that kingdom is going to be forever. And then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet and the ten horns that were in its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. And so we see that that it really wasn't those first three beasts that, that he had a problem with. It was that fourth beast that was really giving him concern. And, and the understanding of the horns and the little horn that had eyes and was speaking prideful and arrogant things. And I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came. And a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So we see that in addition to the facts that we already had about this uh, little horn, we see that it had uprooted three. It was intelligent. It was arrogant. It came after the ten horns or the ten kings or the ten nations were already in a confederation together. So the revival of the Roman Empire is going to take place. The Antichrist is not going to be a part of the initial assemblage together of those ten nations. They are going to come together. And then the Antichrist is going to show up uh, on the scene. And then we see that it tells us that this Antichrist is going to persecute the saints of the Most uh, High. And he will overcome the nation of Israel and bring the nation underneath his authority, but ultimately he is going to be judged by God. And so we see that then the saints are going to come and to possess the kingdom. And in verse 23, and thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and, and break it in, in pieces. And, and so the sphere of that coming ruler is going to be worldwide. And Daniel was told that the empire is going to devour the whole earth, and it will be a ferocious conquest in which that kingdom is going to uh, trample and crush anybody that uh, opposes it. And, and so you will remember the way in which the uh, the Roman Empire was known uh, for its 
absolute strength in the way that it would just crush any opposition. And, and so here we see that this coming kingdom is also going to crush those that oppose it. And so this anticipates now the coming of the one world government. We see that it's going to come underneath a, a one world dictator. There's going to be a mark. No one's going to be able to, uh, to buy or sell uh, without this uh, mark. And, uh, and, and so it is just uh, very, very interesting that, uh, that this is all a part that you can't even, it says, buy or sell without the, uh, the mark of the beast. Now, uh, Amazon has just come out uh, with a store, the Amazon store, that doesn't have cash registers. And, and what happens uh, is that in order to get in, you have to scan your Amazon card so that you have to have, a, uh, of course, an, an Amazon account. And then you go through the store, you take whatever you want, and then you just walk out of the store with it. And it automatically knows exactly what you took out with you. And then it charges you right onto your Amazon account. Now, the interesting thing about that, right, is that it is going to prevent shoplifting 100%. Because you cannot even enter the store without an account. Number two, you can't put anything in your pockets and sneak out. It already knows, okay, from, uh, from the coats. So uh, what they're saying now uh, is that everybody else is going to have to decide whether they're going to go to a system like this because of the amount of money that businesses lose because of theft uh, from the stores. They're not going to be able to keep it the, at the same margins that Amazon is going to be able to operate if you have absolutely zero theft uh, that isn't going on. And so... Uh, then what does that mean? It means that, you know, with Amazon, you can't even go into the store unless you identify yourself with that card. You can't even, you can't buy anything in there. You can't use a credit card in there. There is no ca cash is worthless to you that you can't take gold. You can't take a Bitcoin <laughs> and, uh, and, and give it to them. They have no way of accepting uh, any of that. You have to be a member. And it's just an interesting that the mark of the beast, you're not going to be able to buy or to sell uh, at all unless you have got the, uh, the mark of the beast. And so very interesting where we're headed right now with technology and, uh, and with this store that, uh, that Amazon uh, is running. But uh, either way, we see that this dictator is going to uh, rise uh, up, and, and so uh, this anticipates that uh, one world dictator, and, and in the 13th chapter of Revelation, you have a lot more information about uh, the Antichrist and the whole world being dom dominated by the Antichrist. In verse 24, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. And, and so now the angel starts to give the meaning of those ten horns, that there are ten kings in the kingdom. And, and so uh, the fourth empire, even though it's got great power, is going to be characterized by a progressive weakness, a deterioration, division. And so we see here that, you know, that after those 10 horns, that's when that Antichrist rises, but there's no time given to us. We don't know if it's very shortly after the 10 come together or, or if it is a, a protracted progression to, to when this comes about, but certainly one of the things that we look for on the prophetic and horizon uh, is these nations uh, coming together. Certainly we see the, the EU uh, as a regathering now of these nations that are gathered together. Now uh, there's more than 10 here. We see that there's going to be some type of a shakeout or there will be some way in which 10 of them are going to uh, emerge amongst the, uh, the others. And, and these will be then the, uh, the infrastructure from which we're going to see uh, these things take place. And, uh, and so that is a certain possibility. Uh, there may be another way that 10 of these nations form together, but certainly the, uh, the EU uh, looks like it is the preliminary uh, gathering structure uh, of this revived Roman Empire that is spoken about here. And so the three kings uh, now, uh, they are going to 
and to give their allegiance or be subdued to the Antichrist. Verse 25, and he shall speak pompous words against the, uh, the Most uh, High and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. It's, it's interesting today in our culture where, where they say that there is no such thing as truth, and you can't even know truth. And, and when we say God made man in his image and likeness, male and female, they say ridiculous. And, uh, and so these, the, these arrogance attacks against God and against the structure of God and against the revelation of truth itself, we see that this is the, uh, the secular attack of our culture today. The Antichrist, he is going to be right on this bandwagon right here. He, he is going to ride the very same pompous arrogance uh, of society against God that is now being bandered about today. And so that is the spirit of Antichrist. We see it already and we see the culture now uh, being moved uh, by the spirit of Antichrist. They're going to persecute the saints uh, of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law and then the saints shall be given into his hand and for a times and times and half a time. Now, uh, notice here that when, when Daniel is talking about the saints, he's not talking about Christians. He, he is talking about Jews. He is talking about the nation of Israel. And so the nation of Israel, the Jews, are going to be given into the uh, hand of the Antichrist. It says for times, time, and half a time. Now, times, time, and half a time means three and a half uh, years. Uh, so times means two Time means one, and then a half of time. So you have a two plus a one plus a half, and so that's how you get to three and a half. The, we see that they're going to be given into the authority. It says that times and laws are going to be changed. Uh, and so this is going to take place. You will remember when the Antichrist uh, rises up, stops the worship in the temple, demands that he himself be uh, worshipped as God. And this is going to take place at the midpoint uh, of the tribulation period. The tribulation is the final seventh week of Daniel's prophecy. That's that final tribulation. And then halfway through, the three and a half year mark is now when laws are going to be changed. The Antichrist is going to uh, rise uh, up and he is going to demand that he himself be worshipped. The saints, the Jews are going to be given into uh, his uh, hand. Nothing is going to stop the Antichrist at that point. In verse 26, it says, But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. When the judge, uh, when the ancient of days, when God the Father convenes uh, the court, we see that he is going to judge the little horn, his power is removed and, and he is destroyed. And all of that takes place at the second coming of Jesus Christ, at Christ's return. It says, in the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people. The saints of the Most High, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. And, uh, and so here again, we see the glorious reign of Jesus Christ over the whole earth. We see uh, reigning with the saints. We see the Old Testament saints as well uh, as the church is going to be reigning uh, with him. We know that the bride returns with Christ and we are the bride of Christ and, and that we will rule and reign with Jesus Christ, with the Old Testament saints, the saints uh, here uh, with Christ in his millennial kingdom. And here in verse 28, this is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me and my countenance changed, but uh, I kept the matter uh, in my heart. And so this uh, prophetic panorama that uh, Daniel has given it, uh, it was so awesome that, uh, that, that even Daniel now was, was deeply moved uh, by it. And, uh, and so 
We see that God has laid out here in this seventh chapter the history prophetically in advance that as we look back at it now has occurred exactly in the exact sequence. He didn't get one nation out of order. There was no stretching the description of these kingdoms, their power, what their strengths were and, and what they were known for as their identifying markers. We see absolutely perfect descriptions of those kingdoms and, and we see the accuracy of God's word. For what reason? That you might know one thing. Ready? God is in control. Amen. He is in control throughout all the wars that have fought, throughout all the turbulence, the four winds blowing on the, uh, on the great sea, the, uh, the various different beasts that come uh, out of the sea. God is in control. God is in control. God is in control. And, and we look and, you know, it says, oh my gosh, look, uh, look at this kingdom rises up against this kingdom. Exactly as God said that it was going to, uh, to happen. And thus, we know from the historicity of, uh, of his past, so far, God is batting a thousand for a thousand. Uh, and, and there is no reason to expect that, uh, that, that he will ever change uh, that. Every single promise is certain. Every single bit of the word of God is going to come to pass. Jesus himself said this. He said, do not think that I came to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. Verily I say unto you, not one jot, not one tittle is going to pass away from the book of the law till every single bit of it has been fulfilled. And so we have the assurance of God on that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we are so encouraged that, uh, that in the darkness of our day and in the culture wars, the division, uh, the challenges, the, uh, the problems that are mm, around it, it can feel like things are, are getting out of control. But God, you are the one that told us these things, that we might be anxious for nothing that we would trust you wholeheartedly and, and completely. That though we will go through difficult times, that you will keep your hand of protection upon us. That you will bring us from glory to glory into your eternal glory. And so God, we, we look forward with faces upturned and hands outstretched. We trust you in, in all things. We love you with all of our heart. And bless us and help us now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.